Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. 2 Samuel chapter 2, beginning with verse 12. 2 Samuel 2, 12. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when the man offered sacrifice, the priest's servants came while the flesh was seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he stuck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. And all that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servants came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as they soul desire of them, he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore, the sin of the young men was grievous and very great before the Lord, for the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Father, we ask this evening that you would allow us to have quiet thoughts in our minds. Our hearts would be calm, and you would allow us to focus and to think about thy words Allow us to follow the proper examples of Scripture. Let us learn to avoid the wrong examples we find in the Bible. We do ask that you would use the Scripture, use this message tonight for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please uh, be seated. Abhorring God's offering... That's what the sons of Eli were doing. They were pouring the offering of God. As we saw from the text that was read, they did not want to follow a procedure that God had given to them. A poor has the idea of a disgust or, or hatred against something. And this is what they were doing. This is what they had against the policy, the practice of the sacrifice of God. Now these two men, the two sons of Eli's, they abhorred the sacrifice of God. If you are a born-again Christian, the scripture commands you in Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12 and verse 9, the Bible says, Abhor that which is evil. Rather, the Bible says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. What we are to abhor, what you are to abhor, is that which is evil. And we are to cleave to that which is good. In this instance here, the sons of Eli, they were doing just the opposite. This practice of abhorring the good and loving the evil began in Genesis chapter 4. Actually, it began with the fall. But the example we have in Genesis chapter 4 is the account with when you have Cain and Abel. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 through 5, And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain... And to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. You see, 
Cain and Abel, one brother, offered a proper sacrifice, a sacrifice that was acceptable to God. The other brother, Cain, he offered a sacrifice that was not acceptable to God. God had specific ways in which he wanted to have a sacrifice done, both during the time of Cain and Abel and during the time of Eli. And even during our time, sacrifices of a different sort. There are proper ways that God wants sacrifices to be done. Obviously, it was wrong for the sons of Eli to abhor the sacrifice, or abhor the offerings of God. The redeemed can only rest in the fully accomplished work of Calvary's cross. That's what we are resting in today. We're not resting in anything else but that. The sacrificial system of the Old Testament pointed to and was a picture of what was to take place upon the cross of Calvary. God wants acceptable sacrifices. He doesn't want the sacrifices of, of Cain. He doesn't want the sacrifices of the sons of Eli. He wants acceptable sacrifices. In the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12, the Bible tells us, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself, your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what that is, what that is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God must be first, and God must be only in everything that you do, and everything that we do. If we put things out of order, if we bring something ahead of God, then that something becomes an idol, something we could see. Perhaps it could be something we could see, or some other philosophy that we embrace. Notice in verse 12, the Bible says, now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. There are two men who were part of the household of Eli. Eli around this time was in his 90s. Over in chapter 4, verse 15 will tell us that. The Bible says over there in 415, Now Eli was 90 and 8 years old, and his eyes were dim, that he could not see. So clearly, we know that Eli was in his 90s when his sons were doing those things that were against the standard of God. We should never, we should never do things that are contrary to God's standard. It's, it's, it's a, our source of authority. We have to look to the Bible and we must base the principles Everything we do each day, the way we live our life, must be biblically based. It cannot go any other direction. If there's something that you are doing, if there's something that we are doing that's contrary to a biblical principle, we must stop doing that. And we must turn and go in the direction the Scripture would point us. Sons of Eli, they were going in the wrong direction. The Bible says they knew not the Lord. Now, Eli was the high priest of the nation of Israel. High priests came from the tribe of Levi. They came from the family of Aaron. And they had a, they had a specific job to do. Exodus chapter 27 tells us part of that job. If you look over at Exodus chapter 27, verse 21, the Bible will tell us what the, jo the job of the Levites were. You can't isolate it to one verse, but this one verse gives you an idea of some of the things they were supposed to do. In the tabernacle of the congregation, without the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall order it from evening to morning, 
before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever unto their generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. So Aaron and his sons were responsible, since they were to order it from morning to evening. This was their job. But there was corruption within the priesthood. The sons of Eli, at the very top, right below Eli, they would become the high priest, one of them, if their father would die. But yet, they were wicked men. They abhorred God's sacrifice. They were sons of Belial. The idea behind that, that they were worthless, good for nothing, unprofitable. In some instances, when we see the word Baal or Belial being used in Scripture, it goes even to the point of being a Satan worshiper. Someone that's worshiping someone or giving plenty of value in Satan. Light and darkness do not mix. God and Satan do not mix. You mix white paint and black paint, get a quart of white paint and a quart of black paint, you mix it together, you're going to get gray paint. And if the job calls for white paint, that's no good. The job that we are called to perform, the job we are called to do, is all God and no Satan. We don't want a drop of Satan to mix with what God wants to do. It has to be all God. We can't have God 90% of the time in our life, and then the other 10% of the time we have something else, pursuing after Baal. We don't want to be considered daughters or sons of Belial. We want to be classified and considered the children of God. In 2 Corinthians, Paul reminded the church at Corinth of a very important principle. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 and following, Second Corinthians six fourteen. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Unequal yoke. That's black paint. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Unrighteousness black paint. And what communion hath light with darkness? Darkness. Black paint. The answer to these questions in verse 14 is they don't. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Again, the answer to the questions of verse 15, they have no part and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The temple of God, our bodies, has no agreement whatsoever with idols. Verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. In the book of Samuel, we have an example of two men who failed to separate themselves from Baal who failed to separate themselves from unbelievers, from unrighteousness. 
with darkness. They didn't separate from darkness. They didn't separate, separate themselves from infidels. And they were coming had close associations with the temple of idols. So in the Old Testament, we can take we look at we can look at the New Testament, see that passage in 2 Corinthians, a passage that deals with separation, and understand how crucial this principle is across all dispensations of time, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's very important for you, very important for me, to separate from wickedness. Going, looking back at verse 14. We don't want to have an unequal yoke. We need to stay away from unbelievers when at all possible. We want to avoid the darkness. All these things must be followed. It's a, it's a prescription that must be followed. See, the prescription guidelines that God gave to the children of Israel about how to function in the temple and in the tabernacle were very specific. And we see the sons of Eli were sons of Belial and they knew not the Lord. So one must start with, with knowing the Lord. Christ became flesh. He dwelt among us. And the apostles were able to behold his glory. He became flesh. He came to this earth to die for us so that we could live with him. He came to die. He was entombed for three days and three nights. And he rose again. And now he is seated at the right hand of God. And God wants us, God wants you, to abhor that which is evil. God wants you not to follow in the ways of Baal. But he wants you to follow in the ways of righteousness. Belial is used several different times in the book of Samuel. Hannah was accused of being a daughter of Belial, but that was the wrong assessment that Eli had. She was in grief, praying to the Lord. In chapter 30, rather chapter 20, in verse 1, we notice that Belial is also mentioned. First Samuel chapter twenty and verse one. And David, David, David fled from Naoth and Ramah, and came and said before Jonathan, "What have I done? What is my iniquity? And what is my sin before thy father that he seek my life?" That's First Samuel twenty. Second Samuel 20. I'm sorry, Second Samuel 20. Second Samuel 20 and verse 1. And there happened to be there a man of Belial whose name was Sheba, the son of Berkey, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no part in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse, every man to his tents, O Israel. You see, Baal, those of Belial, are against those who are with Jehovah. So this evening, in this community, in this state, in this country, and those countries around the world that are not with Jehovah, they're with Belial, they're with Baal. People in this country, people in this world, people in this city, the pagans who live around us, the pagans with whom we live and dwell each day, they are against everything that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ 
teaches. They are opposed to it. As long as we're in 2 Samuel, turn back to chapter 16, 2 Samuel 16, another example of Belial being cited or being mentioned in, in the books of 1 and 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 16 and verse 7. And thus said Shimei, when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, thou man of Belial. So calling, associating someone with Belial is not necessarily a good thing. It's not a good thing. Baal is a false god. Belial can even be directly associated with Satan. And then back to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 30, and verse uh, 22, 1 Samuel 30, and verse 22. Then answered all the wicked men and the men of Belial, those that went with David, and said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may heed them, rather lead them away and depart. You see, when someone's associated with Baal and Belial, they are on the wrong side. You do not want to be on the wrong side. We should not want to be on the side of Belial or on the side of anti-God. Something that comes up and takes the place of God. No matter what that thing or that person might be. Or perhaps it could be a philosophy that's taking the place of God. The sons of Eli had everything they didn't need and nothing they did need. Today, we have the completed canon of Scripture. That's what we need. We need the Word of God in our life. The words of God must be part of our life. The sons of Eli, the word of God was absent from their life because they were pursuing the things of Baal. They were pursuing things that were anti-God. The Bible says right there in verse 12, they knew not the Lord. These men were just concerned about what pleased them. They weren't concerned about pleasing the Lord. They wanted to please themselves and not the Lord. So when we look at ourselves, are we like these two men who are said to have not known the Lord and were sons of Belial? Baal worship and Satan worship, they go hand in hand. The Lord Jesus Christ, he told the Pharisees, in John, John chapter 8, he told them, Ye of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. John, verse 44. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there was no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Christ pointed to the Pharisees. He says, Ye are your father, the devil. And when we have a wrong alliance with Satan, or when we're opposed to something that God wants us to do, what Christ told the Pharisees may be applicable to look at, look at ourselves. The scripture is the perfect law of liberty, James tells us. It's like a mirror. We look into the word of God and we see what has to change in our life. If something has to change, we have to change it. But the Bible tells us that we are on the wrong track. If the Bible tells you that you're going in the wrong direction, you're doing something perhaps that is not biblical, then it's our duty to change. We dare not change what the Bible says. We have to change the way we are responding to what the Bible says. And of course, in, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah, 
had a conflict with the prophets of Baal. The people had two opinions, whether to serve Baal or to serve God. So Elijah called all the people, all the prophets of Baal, up to the Mount Carmel. And it was demonstrated there in 1 Kings 18, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that Baal was wrong and Baal was false, and the Lord Jehovah was right. And Elijah, God demonstrated there that he was God and that Baal was false. In your life, time after time and time, God can be demonstrated as real and Satan and his forces false. Don't let Satan give you misguided direction in your life. Satan or his minions or perhaps even people you may know who want you to do something that's wrong. You must do something, you must do that which is right. You cannot do that which is wrong. In verse... In verse 13, I'm sorry. In verse 13, the Bible says, it talks about the custom. It says, And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was seething with a flush hook of three teeth in his hand. Again, this is the prescription of what the priests were to do. They took a flesh hook with three teeth on it, a long instrument that they could stick into the pot, the cauldron, the container where the offering was being boiled. In Leviticus chapter 8, verse 31, the Bible describes part of this here. Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 31. The Bible says, And Moses, eight thirty one. And Moses said to Aaron and to his sons, Boil the flesh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they eat it with the bread that is in the basket of consecration, as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his sons shall eat of it. So in some of the offerings, not all of them, in some of the offerings, the Leviticus outlines you know, burnt offerings, meat offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings, trespass offerings, all these different types of offerings. But in some cases... The offering, part of that offering, was for the priests. In other cases, nothing was for the priest. Everything was consumed. But in this instance, in this particular offering, the priests were directed by God to take part of it. And the way they would do this was to get the flesh hook, put a flesh hook down there and, and grab it uh, and pull some meat up. But there was a certain time they were supposed to do this. You know, the sacrificial system continued all the way up until the time when the Lord Jesus Christ was on the cross and cried, It is finished. And the veil in the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. And now we have no longer a need for an earthly high priest. But the Lord Jesus Christ is our heavenly high priest. He is the one who has completed it all. 
He's completed the picture. In Hebrews chapter 4, in verse 15, Hebrews 4.15, the Bible reminds us, it tells us, Hebrews chapter 4, in verse 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We no longer, in this time period we live, need the sacrificial system of the Aaronic priesthood. Jesus Christ has become our great high priest. And we can come boldly to him in time of need to obtain mercy, to find grace. So when you do something, when I do something, that's contrary to the word of God. When we transgress, when we miss the mark, when we cross the line, when we sin, there's a remedy for that. We can find help. We can find mercy. We can find grace. First John 1 John 1.9 tells us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so these men, the sons of Eli, who were opposed to everything God wanted them to stand for, they gave false instructions to the people that were assisting them in this process. Verse 14 tells us, And he struck into the pan, or kettle, or cauldron, or pot, some place, something that held the meat that they were boiling, and brought up the priest took for himself. So did they in Shiloh, until all the Israelites came thither. So there's different times that pans are used, kettles, pots, cauldrons. They're all containers that hold or were to hold the meat that was being boiled, that was on the fire being boiled. Notice the scripture mentions Shiloh. Shiloh is a place of rest. Shiloh is a prophetic name for the Messiah. First mentioned back there in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 49. Genesis 49, when Jacob was blessing his sons shortly before his death. In Genesis chapter 49, in verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now have, have you found the rest that you need in the Messiah? Are you resting in the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you abhorring the sacrifice of what was done for you? Abhorring the sacrifice upon Calvary's cross. You know, we, we come boldly in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. The Bible tells us that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. And that's what we must do. There is no longer any need for early, pardon me, for any tabernacle of the Aaronic priesthood. We don't need that priesthood anymore. The Lord Jesus Christ has done it all. And in verse, in verse 15 of, second, of 1 Samuel chapter 2, Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servants came and said to the man at sacrifice, Give flesh to roast for the priests, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee but raw. You see, they didn't like the way that God told them to do it. They didn't want the sodden flesh. They wanted to eat it raw. But there was a specific way 
They wanted it before the fat was burned away. The scripture prescribed in Leviticus chapter 9, in verse 10, a specific way of making this particular sacrifice. In Leviticus 9, in verse 20, and they put, uh, Leviticus 9, verse 20, and they put the fat upon the beasts, and he burnt the fat upon the altar. This is the way it was supposed to be done. God does not want anyone at any time, particularly those who were part of the children of Israel, part of his chosen people, nor does he want those that are part of the church, two distinct groups of people. He doesn't want anyone in those groups to turn to idol worship. You know, in the book of Isaiah, the prophet reminds us and tells us that people would have such a lack of understanding, they would cut a tree down, and they would divide it into thirds, perhaps, perhaps not equally, equal thirds. But with part of it, they would make an idol. Other part of it, they would cook their food. Another part of it, they would use it for something else. In Isaiah 44 and 18 to 20, they tell, Isaiah tells us about that. And, you know, if you look, if you look at the passage in Isaiah... You know, the, the Bible is, is full of examples. Sometimes there are examples for positive things. Other times there are, there are negative things, things we should avoid. And we don't want to be like this group of people in the day of Isaiah. In the days of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 18. <clears throat> they have not known nor understood, for if shut their eyes that they cannot see, in their hearts that they cannot understand, and none condemneth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I burned part of it in the fire, yea, also I baked bread upon coals, whereof I roasted flesh and eaten of it, and I shall make the residue thereof an abomination. Shall I fall down to the stalks of a tree? He feedeth on ashes, and deceived heart hath turned him aside, and he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? Hearts that are deceived. He feedeth on ashes a deceived heart, hath he turned him aside. Don't let your hearts be deceived. Don't let yourselves be directed in the wrong way. You know, looking at the examples here, of these sons. It says they knew not the Lord. They were sons of Belial. We must worship and trust the only true God. There is only one. You know, Peter mentions this in his epistle in 1 Peter 1 8, whom having not seen, Ye love, in whom though now ye see him, not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. First Peter, First Peter 1 Peter 1.8. You know, who were they trusting? They were trusting in the wrong thing. They were trusting in things that were the cursed things. They were not trusting in the Lord Jehovah. God wants us, God wants you to trust in the one and true God. He wants you to put away the idolatry that you have. He wants us to remove the idols from our hearts, from our minds. Put aside things that do not belong there. To Put aside things that are getting in the way with our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to put aside. In verse 16... And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. So these, these men in the priesthood who were 
trying to follow the right way of doing things, when the servants of the sons of Eli came to them and demanded the flesh, they were so determined that they would take it by force. You must be resolved to do what God wants and not what you want. So often, we want to do what we want to do and not what God wants us to do. If our desires conflict with God, we must obey God and not our own desires. You know, Job in... Job 23, in verse 13, he, he, he makes this observation. Job 23, in verse 13. But he is in one mind, and who can turn him what his soul desireth, even what he doeth? So our souls, our hearts, must have godly desires. In Proverbs 21, verse 10, the Bible says, The soul of the wicked desires evil. His neighbor findeth no favor in his eyes. May we not have wicked souls, like the sons of Eli. But may our souls be righteous. A constant daily process. The doctrine of sanctification will be becoming more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a growth process. Little infants, they don't grow to be adults in a day. They grow up pretty quick, but not in a day. It's a process. And we, as God's children, continually need to grow continually become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to change sometimes the way that we are living. We have to change it. God has to work in us. We cannot want to do things our own way. We have to do things God's way. Because when we start doing things our own way, we start thinking like the sons of Eli. Verse 17. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. For the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. The sin being very great. This is God's standard. You know, it's not, not my standard, not your standard, not, not the fellow that lives down the street standard. It's God's standard. And that's the standard we must use. People today, and people in all time periods of history, must acknowledge the fact that they're a sinner. Some people may not want to acknowledge they're a sinner. They think they're, they're good people. And again, moving to the standard of man, maybe they are good people. But that's man's standard. But God is the one that has a standard of what's good and what's evil. When he looked at the sons of Eli, what did he see? He, he saw evil people, evil men, who were serving in the priesthood. You know, in Romans 3.23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That applies to everybody. It also says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Salvation is a gift. It's not something that we can earn. It's a gift. 
It's not something we can work for. Jorge Bergoglio and his predecessor, Joseph Ratzinger, abhor the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is going on today. For every single day, every hour, someplace in the world, their minions trample the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They abhor the offering of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross. They teach salvation by works. Don't follow a false gospel that abhors God's sacrifice. The Lord Jesus Christ has done something no one else has. He's died for you. He's died for us as individuals, as particular individuals. The work of redemption is finished. So we should be rejoicing in what God has done for us. We must not be like these sons of Eli who abhor the sacrifice of God. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 and following, it talks about our great God and Savior. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Keep doing what the Bible prescribes and don't follow in the footsteps of the sons of Eli. Father, thank you for thy word. We do ask that thou would give us the understanding of how to rightly divide the scripture, how to apply it to our hearts, how to stay in the word so that thou can use it to change us and to conform us to the image of thy son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray, amen. Please take your hymnal and turn to hymn three.